Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's nice to uh, be here virtually giving this talk and I apologize to everyone who's there in person for subjecting you to a Zoom talk. Um, okay, so I'm talking about the bootstrap. Uh, the bootstrap is, uh, the general idea of the bootstrap is to use physical consistency conditions to constrain and potentially solve theories. And, and in practice, this works by carving out theory space um, showing uh, which um, uh, hypothetical theories are actually inconsistent and which ones can possibly be consistent. And in ideal situations, you, you carve out enough of theory space to isolate um, uh, interesting observables. Um, and the kinds of consistency conditions um, that are most interesting to use are ones that are present non-perturbatively. So these would be, uh, for example, unitarity, symmetries, um, and causality and potentially other consistency conditions. Um, and all of these consistency conditions are, are related to each other. And much of the power of the bootstrap comes from the fact that they cut across each other in interesting and non-trivial ways. And the point of this is that um, by relying on non-perturbative structures, bootstrap methods can work even in strongly coupled systems. So it, it, basically the, the idea of the bootstrap is to just do everything you can do to constrain a theory. Use all the information you can. And in many cases, um, it's just these non-perturbative structures that we currently have access to. So there are two main approaches um, that come to mind when thinking about the bootstrap. Um, and one famous one was the solution of a wide class of uh, two-dimensional conformal field theories by Belvin, Polyakov, and Zamolodzikov in the 80s. Um, their, their central um, breakthrough was to realize that there exists a, a powerful symmetry of these theories, an infinite dimensional symmetry. Um, and using this symmetry was enough to constrain and completely solve a wide class of theories. Um, over the last decade, there's been a new kind of approach that's emerged um, that I'll roughly call the method of linear functionals. Um, due to Ritazzi, Richkov, Tani, and Vicky. And the general procedure is to find some rules, find consistency conditions that can be phrased as some rules that have some kind of positivity properties. Um, and then look for linear functionals that prove things about the sum rules. And I'll give a more precise example of that in a moment. And this, this may, may sound a little silly. It's not clear if this um, is actually gonna yield anything useful. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment too. Um, but one important point is that this method does not require exact solvability. Um, so it's much more widely applicable than the happy cases when we have infinite dimensional symmetries. Um, and I would say that this method basically exploits the rigidity of symmetric quantum systems. The idea is that um, quantum mechanics gives us positivity coming from the positive definiteness of the inner product on Hilbert space. Um, if you combine that positivity with symmetries, um, then some, in some cases you get a system that's sufficiently rigid that you can constrain it to very high precision or, or even solve it. Um, and it's an open question how much symmetry exactly is needed. After the work by BPZ in the 80s, um, it was generally thought that you needed an infinite dimensional symmetry group, a very powerful symmetry group to make progress. And one of the lessons over the last decade is that sometimes you can get away with a lot less and really symmetry and positivity play together in surprising ways. Um, so here's a, a very toy example of the idea of, of um, the method of linear functionals. Um, so let's imagine uh, a theory with a sum rule. Um, in this case, uh, it's, it would be, this is like a 1D scale invariant theory. Um, and the sum rule says that a sum over the spectrum of the theory. So there are some deltas, which are like scaling dimensions of this theory of some positive quantities, lambda squared times a known function um, is equal to zero. Um, and this is uh, the general form of a kind of sum rule that you often get in quantum mechanics. The, the squared quantities would come from norms of states and the known functions would come from using symmetries to constrain matrix elements. 
Um, so in this case, if you have this sum rule, we can prove something about it with a linear functional. We can consider the linear functional that takes a function of z to its derivative at one half. And if you apply this to the functions appearing in the sum rule, you get this quantity uh, two to the two minus delta times delta. Um, and the point is that this quantity is positive when delta is positive and negative when delta is negative. Um, and so uh, applying this to the sum rule, you deduce that there has to exist at least one negative delta in this theory. So that's a very simple piece of information that you can get out of the sum rule by considering linear functionals. Um, and in general, the challenge is to find linear functionals that prove interesting things. So this result maybe isn't so interesting, but by considering the full space of all possible linear functionals that you can apply to all possible sum rules, you, you learn interesting information from each functional and, and together uh, they might combine to something non-trivial. Um, and one of the uh, key insights in this work of Rotazzi, Richcock, Tani, and Beeky is that um, first of all, this linear functional method can be useful. And second of all, it can often be attacked fruitfully using, um, using a computer. So this problem of finding interesting functionals that respect positivity conditions is a convex optimization problem that can be solved using linear programming or more generally semi-definite programming. So um, these bootstrap constraints just coming from the method of linear functionals turn out to be surprisingly powerful in conformal field theories. Um, uh, it's already, it was already mentioned um, in previous talks, why conformal field theories are interesting. You can think of them as building blocks of quantum field theories. They're, um, they have extra symmetries, for example, scale invariance, and those extra symmetries, um, first of all, are related to the fact that they appear universally um, as the long distance limit of, of quantum field theories, general quantum field theories, but also those extra symmetries give us uh, a better handle on constraining them. Um, and conformal field theories come equipped with a large set of sum rules coming from the associativity of the operator product expansion. Um, so using this method of linear functionals um, and uh, uh, techniques like semi-definite programming, um, we've learned that these sum rules, um, when combined with positivity, contain a surprising amount of information about CFTs. As an example, they often determine critical exponents in CFTs that are relevant for condensed matter and statistical systems to high precision. So here are a couple of plots. On the left is a plot of um, a bootstrap-based determination of critical exponents in the 3D icing model, which describes, for example, liquid vapor transitions and uniaxial magnets. So the bootstrap island is this tiny little blue sliver. I'm not sure if you can, uh, can see it um, very well. Um, on the right is another bootstrap island. This little blue sliver is uh, showing the space of scaling dimensions for the O2 model, which describes the superfluid transition in liquid helium, uh, among other systems. So these are systems that uh, uh, exhibit strongly coupled phase transitions um, that are not really amenable to traditional perturbative techniques, where the best techniques for studying them uh, before the bootstrap were Monte Carlo techniques. And the bootstrap gives another window onto these theories. Um, over the last 10 years, these kinds of bootstrap techniques have been applied to a, a, a huge zoo of theories, including theories that are um, uh, hard to access using other methods. So Clay, for example, showed bounds on maximally supersymmetric theories in four and six dimensions. Um, there's been lots of studies of supersymmetric theories, theories with relevance for uh, condensed matter in two and three dimensions, um, a huge zoo and too much for me to list on this slide. Um, but the general lesson is that um, uh, conformal field theories are, are examples of rigid enough symmetric quantum systems. Um, so the symmetry in conformal field theories, even in higher dimensions where we don't have an infinite dimensional symmetry group is, is enough for these um, bootstrap techniques to apply and be really fruitful. And so this, these conformal bootstrap results have changed our idea of which kinds of theories may be solvable, at least, at least numerically. Now, um, I, I think we should expect that um, any theory with a small number of degrees of freedom, say a small central charge, um, 
and gaps in the operator spectrum should be amenable to a numerical bootstrap approach like this. And it potentially opens the door to a classification and at least numerical solution of theories that are relevant of conformal field theories that are relevant in condensed matter physics. And there's a there's a huge amount to do in this area because the bootstrap calculations that have been done are, are actually quite primitive in that they only use a small set of the constraints that are present in these theories. There's a vast set of bootstrap constraints that remain unexplored. Um, and the evidence is that these constraints should contain a huge amount of useful information and let us determine many observables to high precision. And it's really, um, to a large extent, an algorithmic problem to figure out how to tease out the information from these constraints. Um, so we need smart algorithms to use these new constraints. And there are some impressive examples of cases where um, uh, uh, analytic bootstrap methods have combined with numerical methods to give much better algorithms than the naive ones that uh, are often used for these kinds of computations. Um, so, for example, uh, in this paper by Akami, Jetty, Hartman, and Tajdini, they um, came up with a different numerical algorithm than the traditional semi-definite programming that was an improvement by something like a factor of a thousand um, over previous methods and we're able to um, push the convex optimization calculations in that case to their, basically to their limit and figure out exactly what information was in the constraints they were solving, even though that information was hidden in basically an infinite dimensional convex optimization problem. So I, I think- you, you should try to uh, add those con conclusion a minute over okay. time. I'm a minute over time, wow, okay. All right, so um, this is my last slide. So. Uh, in recent years, it's been understood that um, uh, there are other examples of basically symmetry structures that make the theory amenable to a bootstrap analysis. So, for example, effective field theories are, it turns out, um, sufficiently rigid systems. They have Poincaré symmetry and unitarity and causality, and these are enough to do an non-trivial bootstrap analysis. Um, and other examples are uh, coming from mathematics or sphere packings and, and spectra of Laplacians on various manifolds. Recently, there's a matrix model bootstrap, quantum mechanics bootstrap, um, and there were interesting developments in possibly bootstrapping cosmological correlators. And these are all related to the general question of how much symmetry do we need for these techniques to work? Uh, I'll stop there. Thanks a lot. Say for this beautiful summary. We have time perhaps for one or two quick questions. Do I see any raised hands? Nothing? Okay, I'm, I'm tempted to ask this question. But I, one of the amazing things about that Ising model example you showed is that the entire plane is excluded except for that one tiny region. And one of the things these methods have done is to exclude the presence of conformal fixed points. Are there any examples where there are new conformal fixed points that people didn't know about before that were discovered by these techniques? Um. That's an excellent question. Um, there are uh, there are examples of features that may hint at other conformal theories, um, but I would say uh, the numerical bounds that I'm aware of are not really conclusive enough in that, for example, these features appear as kinks in curves uh, and not necessarily islands yet. Um, so for example, for fermionic, um, uh, CFTs in 3D that are related to the gross navi yukawa models, there appear to be other uh, fixed points that are at different, with different critical exponents, but the same, um, but, but a similar kind of operator spectrum. And these um, people have investigated these theories using perturbative techniques to try to understand whether the two fixed points exist and when, when, uh, when they exist. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, these, these methods are most powerful at ruling out theories, but in terms of um, identifying a new theory, um, I, 
I think it's possible, but I don't know of a, a solid example where that's happened yet. Yeah. In, in the spirit of snow mass, looking to the future, it would be amazing if one could have results in four dimensional, you know, four dimensional gauge theory. So if you would talk in your snow mass report about the possibility of that, that would be very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's thank David again. Thanks.